Hey, internet friends. Last year, 3.8 million babies were born in the United States, which might sound like quite a few, but 2017 marked the lowest number of births in 30 years. Experts claim they were baffled as to why fertility rates have plummeted. So let's give it a go, shall we? If we examine the events of the past and follow the breadcrumb trail to the present, would we arrive at a grim glimpse of the future? Would we observe the health of the 99% being sacrificed for the wealth of the 1%? Or would we see a larger agenda begin to emerge, one that has spanned centuries? The agenda to hijack human reproduction? The agenda of total and complete control? Well, let's see. War, plague, famine, throughout history, these events have served as a means of significantly influencing the population. But none of these events transform the family unit quite like the Industrial Revolution, which took place across Europe and America between the 18th and 19th centuries, marking the shift to primarily agrarian and rural societies to industrial and urban societies. Pre-revolution, the family units were production units. Everyone in the household, extended family included, contributed to the family economy. More children meant more production and a more successful family economy, and all of the childcare took place within the household. But all of that changed when families couldn't keep up with the production of machines. Therefore, the family economy suffered, forcing mom, dad, and the children, not the extended family, to move to urban areas and work in factories. And this is how families made the shift from being producers to becoming consumers no longer working for the goal of sustaining the family economy, but the goal then became earning a higher standard of living on an individual level. So while the Industrial Revolution created new technologies and beneficial advancements, the success of the revolution was contingent upon exploiting human labor, forcing families to live in atrocious conditions, thereby altering the relationships between family members forever, with children being viewed as a burden rather than a blessing due to the financial strain. The revolution presented the opportunity for a powerful few to control all of the industry, meaning that the financial divide between social classes continued to widen, which created the environment for modern finance to take root, with its predatory practice of usury as well as its central banking format. There was and is a lot of money to be made off the producer-turned-consumer family unit, and their life's work as debt slaves. But more on that later. Two world wars, an influenza that spread like wildfire, as well as forced sterilization amongst groups eugenicists dubbed undesirable, these events had detrimental effects on the world's population. But post-World War II America experienced a boom, a baby boom more specifically. After 16 years of depression and war, Americans were eager to start families and pursue the elusive American dream of prosperity and freedom. That dream was almost tangible for a time, with the mass production of detached homes, allowing Americans to own their homes and land so they could raise families in the suburbs. Along with the birth rate, the economy was also booming, and the head of the household, the father, typically held a job that provided enough income to purchase a home, perhaps even a vehicle, and allowed mothers to stay at home with their children. However, the women's liberation movement of the 1960s and 70s developed out of the civil rights movement, and it provided a platform for collaborative efforts between feminists and trade unionists. The stated goal of WLM was to challenge the patriarchy and the treatment of women as second-class citizens. And while all that sounds fine and dandy, the WLM targeted the working class, meaning the women who formerly stayed home with their children were encouraged to pursue a career, which yielded in another stream of taxable income per family, and an opportunity for the government and television to raise the children while their parents were working, and for companies to introduce convenience where time was a commodity. And it's not like they've hidden the depopulation agenda. If control is the end goal, certainly a smaller population is easier to control than a larger one. The mysterious Georgia Guidestones Monument was erected in 1980, engraved with a commandment regarding population control to maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. And while we don't know exactly who built it, it's rumored to have been built by billionaire media mogul and CNN founder Ted Turner, who would later go on to urge world leaders to adopt China's one-child policy, partnering up with the Rockefeller family, Bill Gates, George Soros, Warren Buffett, and even Oprah to discuss shrinking the world's population. Originally founded by another eugenicist, Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood began lobbying in Washington, D.C. within the last several decades 
Their primary function is to offer abortions as well as other forms of birth control. And all of this was taking place while Americans began living more sedentary lifestyles than ever before. Consuming processed and genetically modified foods made from crops sprayed with pesticides that were produced by the same government partner, Monsanto, who helped create the atom bomb, Agent Orange, and a series of banned chemicals that were proven to cause cancer. Abortion has become normalized while the notion of the family has become demonized, or at least framed as tired and stale by the media. The television programs that were once riddled with storylines that appealed to the average American, showcasing sitcoms starring families transformed over time, promoting suspended adolescence, sexual promiscuity, narcissism, as well as the bachelor and cat lady lifestyles. Propaganda targeted at women went from offering advice on love, family, and self-care, to glamorizing the concept of the career-oriented woman who waited till later in life to start a family, if at all. The media waged war on motherhood, on fatherhood and on the innocence of children. It only worsened with the introduction of computers and handheld devices, where generations of the past were out making friends, getting married, having sex, and producing offspring in their prime. The young adults of today have largely replaced that essential in-person interaction with screen time. Their social interaction is achieved by posting on social media. Romance is ignited by swiping through a selection of strangers on apps like Tinder, and sexual desire is fulfilled by watching pornography. And unlike past generations, the type of sex being promoted through our media is not only promiscuity between men and women, but being heavily promoted and on the forefront is the LGBT movement. The rainbow agenda is everywhere. Women, African Americans, immigrants, the LGBT community, these marginalized groups that have sought equality and freedom from discrimination, these are the folks who are always used for propaganda. And the fact is, the main function of sex is reproduction. And you aren't getting a whole lot of reproduction if women are having sex with other women, and men are having sex with other men. Which is not just accepted, which is one thing, but it's intensely promoted. Transgenderism is celebrated, and then all of it is normalized through the public school systems. When you consider the evolving gender roles the family unit has endured throughout recent history, along with a change in behavioral norms, it's no surprise that birth rates are down to their lowest numbers in 30 years. The majority of young couples are strapped with debt either from student loans or from a lifestyle they cannot afford, and that affects their decision whether or not to have children. But birth rates are a total separate thing from fertility. One is a result of personal choice, one is not. Can the rise in infertility be attributed to factors like diet and lifestyle? One in six couples struggle with fertility. It's been reported that the average American woman today has 30,000 to 50,000 chemicals in her body that her grandparents did not have. But the chemicals we're exposed to on the daily don't just affect women, they affect male fertility too. The most commonly used herbicide in the US, atrazine, can be found in the soil, in the rainwater, and even in our drinking water. It's sprayed on half of all cornfields in the US. And what is a staple of the US diet? Livestock is fed the GMO corn that's sprayed with the atrazine. People eat the animals, and corn syrup can be found in a number of our processed foods. The EU actually banned atrazine because of suspicions of health problems. But powerful lobbyists kept the atrazine flowing in the United States. Even though it had been shown in animals to reduce male fertility by as much as 50%, as well as induce prostate cancer, and female rodents had a high correlation of induced abortions and breast cancer from exposure. But other factors like obesity, smoking, stress, and sedentary lifestyles, these have all been linked to decreases in sperm count and quality. And shockingly, sperm counts fell between 50% and 60% between 1973 and 2011. If we look to the future where widespread infertility persists as an issue, along with the general lack of interest in starting a family, what will happen? More and more children will be conceived through unnatural means like IVF. The fertility industry will thrive, but the rate of reproduction will not be enough to replace the current workforce. But through our media and our entertainment, and even through new products like the Amazon Echo Dot for children, we've been conditioned to accept the idea of robots replacing humans. So much so that robots are now receiving their own rights, normal human rights. If you stare into the abyss with me, the outlook is pretty bleak. If there is an agenda to hijack human reproduction and we see the plot unfolding in front of us, at what point will we say enough is enough? 
Let me know what you think, internet friends. You know I always look forward to your comments. Thank you so much for watching, subscribing, and supporting my channel on Patreon. Bye!